Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you all for attending today's virtual event made at the library. Um, Patsy Mink, First Woman of Color in Congress, a book talk organized by the Library of Congress's Manuscript Division in honor of Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. I'm Liz Navarra, and I'm the American Women's History Specialist for the Manuscript Division. I co-curated the Library of Congress's Shall Not Be Denied Women Fight for the Vote exhibition during the 2019 and 2020 centennial of the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the US Constitution. And in my role as a women's history specialist, I work on a daily basis with many collections and documents in the division that reveal the history of American women. These materials demonstrate women's activism in reform movements, as well as women's political acumen and their scientific, literary, and cultural achievements. Among these treasures are the papers of Congresswoman Patsy Takamoto Mink. The Mink Collection, which numbers nearly 900,000 items, is arranged in 2,710 boxes, and it's described in a 700 plus page finding aid. The collection documents Mink's entire political career, including her pre-congressional political activism and her election to Hawaii's territorial legislature in 1956. It was in 1964 that Mink became the first woman of color and the first Asian American woman to serve in the US Congress. She represented the people of Hawaii in Congress during two periods, the first from 1965 to 1977, and again from 1990 until her death in 2002. Mink was a vigorous and tireless champion for girls and women, an early and vocal opponent in the Vietnam War, and a leader on issues involving education, the environment, welfare, and civil rights. She's perhaps best known for her work shepherding and defending Title IX, the legislation that celebrates its 50th anniversary this June 23rd, and changed the face of education by prohibiting sex discrimination in federally funded educational programs. Joining me for our discussion today are Judy Wu and Gwendolyn Mink, the authors of the book, Fierce and Fearless, Patsy Takamoto Mink, First Woman of Color in Congress, which was recently released by New York University Press. Also joining me is the Manuscript Division, a Manuscript Division historian and archivist, Meg McAleer. And I'm gonna introduce um, each of the participants. Judy Wu is a professor of Asian American Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and the director of the Humanities Center. She received her PhD in US history from Stanford University and previously taught at Ohio State University. She authored Dr. Mom Chung of the Fair-Haired Bastards, The Life of a Wartime Celebrity, and Radicals on the Road, Internationalism, Orientalism, and Feminism During the Vietnam Era. Wu is currently working on a book that focuses on Asian American and Pacific Islander women who attended the 1977 National Women's Conference. And she's co-editing Unequal Sisters, the fifth edition with Rutledge Press. She's also the co-editor of Women in Social Movements in the United States and editor of Amerasia Journal. She is the co-president of the Berkshire Conference of Women Historians. Wendelin Mink, um, who's also with us today, was a professor of politics um, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and a professor of women and gender studies at Smith College. An independent scholar, she is the author and editor of many books, most recently the co-author of Ensuring Poverty, Welfare Reform in Feminist Perspectives. Wendy is shown here on the left with her mother, Patsy Mink, on the right. And we also have Meg McAleer. Um, she's a historical specialist in the Manuscript Division at the Library of Congress, where she oversees the division's modern diplomatic and military collections, as well as the pre presidential papers of William H. Taft, Woodrow Wilson, and Calvin Coolidge. Prior to 2019, she served as a senior archive specialist in the Manuscript Division, where she led processing projects, including the arrangement and description of the Patsy T. Mink papers. She received her PhD in history from Georgetown University in 1997. And Meg is shown here um, with the rest of the Mink processing team celebrating the completion of processing the collection in 2008. 
So thank you all so much um, for being with us today for this conversation about Fierce and Fearless um, and the Patsy Mink papers. We're going to start off with a discussion between the four of us, um, after which uh, we will open it up to questions from the audience. Um, please use the Q&A function in Zoom um, to submit your questions and not the chat. Um, and the chat will serve um, as a space for us, uh, the hosts, um, to post links to relevant resources. And feel free to post your questions um, at any time during our conversation. I'm gonna start off um, with a question um, for both uh, Judy and Wendy um, to get the conversation started. Um, so one of the most um, compelling characteristics of your book is the way the chapters alternate um, between Wendy's first person recollections and Judy's historical analysis. Um, how did you navigate writing this book together and how did the partnership work? Thanks so much, Liz and Meg, and thank you for being on your phone so that we can hear you. Um, I think your arms are gonna get a little bit sore by the end of the program. Um, I started this project in 2012, so it's, a, it's been a 10 year journey. And when I started, everybody said, oh, you need to talk to, talk to Wendy Mink. And she was very gracious. Uh, we had casual conversations, we had dinners. We moved into conducting oral history interviews. Um, but then I learned that her mother, Patsy Mink wanted Wendy to write her biography. And I think it was challenging to think about how to do that both as a daughter and as a political scientist. And so we decided to collaborate. I'm so grateful for that. Uh, Wendy has these beautiful memoir vignettes that begin each chapter. Um, and they're just so rich and evocative. And then I have a chance to write about her mother as a historian. And she also reviewed my writing as well. So. It made me feel that what I was representing about her mother was reflected in reality. <laughs> um, so um, it's, it's been wonderful to be able to collaborate with Wendy. And I think it's something that's in the spirit of her, her mother's political approach of being a feminist collaborator. I would simply add that um, connecting with Judy was uh, a godsend for me. Um, at many different levels, both in terms of figuring out how to proceed with a biographical work about my mother, but also because Judy is a brilliant synthesizer of modern American history. And to have my mother's story in her hands was uh, really a, a wonderful uh, and encouraging thing. Thank you both. Oh, Wendy lives, I was just going to add that Wendy lives down the street from the Library of Congress. So it was wonderful when I was in town doing research, I could go see her afterwards and say, this is what I found in the archives. And then she can tell me, oh, this is what's happening in our lives. Um, and we would usually have dinner together. So there was a, a Japanese restaurant that used to exist that we would go regularly. And then we would always get Chinese takeout too. So that was fun. Um, that's actually a, a really great segue into to my next question, um, which um, before we delve into some of the topics in the book further, I wanted to talk briefly about um, the Patsy Mink papers and how you research for the book. Um, could you both talk about your research um, in the Mink papers and at the Library of Congress and, and um, how your discoveries in the collection um, may have shaped your writing of the book or in Wendy's case, um, your memories of events? Yeah. Um... My relationship to the papers is somewhat unique. So in a way, what I have to say isn't all that helpful to other researchers since I was close to the subject. But the papers are, are such an incredible, as I think, uh, Liz, you used the word treasure. Um, it's, a, it's a trove of treasures, really, um, that made it possible for me to confirm memories, to add specificity, to events that I knew were important in my mother's life and so forth. So in that sense, it was a, a terrific research aid, um, but it was also uh, the, the collection as a whole and the specific topic areas that we uh, investigated were so incredibly enriched by the material that she kept that are remain in the papers, which are sort of second and third party context materials from the second half of the 20th century. Uh, women's movement leaflets and newsletters, uh, peace activists, 
uh, petitions uh, regarding the war in Vietnam, all of that sort of stuff helped to kind of flesh out the environment in which she was working and making choices about uh, policy direction she wanted to move in. So um, yeah, that was probably the takeaway that was most powerful uh, for me. I was excited to do research in the papers. You know, as a historian, we're always salivating about archives. <laughs> um, and I just happened to be looking at the Library of Congress website and there was a feature about Patsy Mink's papers. And I thought, why hasn't anybody written about her? She's someone who deserves historic recognition. Um, and it's such a luxury to have the vast treasure trove of materials, um, 26, 2700 boxes. Um, I didn't realize how much there was until I started looking and then I start feeling a little panicky <laughs> because there was so much information. It was really helpful to be able to talk to Meg and I'm so glad she's here today and I love that image of all the people who helped process her papers. Um, I remember talking to her early on, she just gave me some tips about what are some things to look for, um, right, as you're, as you're going through these volumes and volumes of papers. And she also said something to me that really stayed with me, which is that in comparison with other congressional papers, there was more evidence of Mink's active voice, like her interventions. It wasn't just her aides, right, who were responding to letters or it was actually her handwriting. It was her comments. Um, and so I felt like I could really get a better sense of who she was and what she valued through, through her papers. Meg, did you want to say anything um, about the process um, and um, of, of of working with the collection and um, some of your takeaways um, from your experience processing absolutely. the collection? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and actually, Wendy and Judy, you just touched on the points I was going to bring up. First of all, um, let me say that um, it was an amazing experience working on this collection. And that photograph uh, was kind of unique in my experience. All of us had felt so connected to Congresswoman Mink that there just had to be a celebration at the end. Um, so it was, um, we had a, an informal luau, the extent to which you can have a luau in a federal government building in Washington, D.C., but we, we tried. Yeah, so the, the collection is, um, everyone keeps using the term treasure trove, and it really is. So it's it's large. It came in at a million items and um, in 1,000 record cartons. Um, so in my experience, it was the largest collection I had ever worked on. So I always point out three things about the collection, which actually Wendy and Judy just said. Um, it is very comprehensive in documenting Patsy Mink's life and career, particularly from the 1950s on. Um, it is just gratifyingly thorough and, and comprehensive. And then exactly what, what Judy just said, the narrative quality of the collection is astounding. We really hear or read Patsy Mink's voice in, in the collection. And, and that's the thing about manuscript collections. It's not about final results, although those are important, but it's how we get to those results. You know, so how is legislation crafted and what happens after that? Um, so, so all of that kind of First person narrative is so rich in this collection. In fact, um, it was it was kind of fun. I was in the reading room and talking to a researcher um, who was using the collection. He was working on um, No Child Left Behind. And I said, oh, well, what did you think about the collection? And he said, it's astounding. He said he has not found this quality of material, historical material anywhere else. Um, he was He was really ecstatic. And, and I think it speaks to that unique narrative that comes across um, in the collection. And as, as Judy said too, um, you know, it's kind of fun. There, there are lots of notes in the papers um, between Congresswoman Mink and her staff. And it's this back, back and forth. Um, so Patsy Mink um, writes in a felt tip, right, Wendy? Um, yes, and, and so, 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 so you see them like almost dialoguing on this piece of paper, you can almost kind of vicariously be part of the conversation. Um, but the, also the third thing I always mention about this collection is how saturated the historical research value is in topics other, I mean, in addition to Title IX, which is what we usually think about Patsy Mink for, it's very strong about other aspects of women's rights and education, welfare reform, the Vietnam War, the environment, 
um, Hawaii and the Pacific, including her work with the Trust Territories, Native Rights, Legal History. Um, I joke it's a, it's a gift that keeps on giving um, and for all of these different topics. And, and it, I think it's borne out with the fact that it is one of our most heavily used collections. Um, so um, we're not just saying it, um, but I think you know, scholars and, and historians have found it incredibly valuable and useful. Thanks so much, Meg, um, for that perspective. Um, that's a really great um, Liz, overview of the mind, collection. Do you mind if I just add uh, a couple of things? Oh, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I was just thinking as we were talking that one, I think the level of materials that's in the collection reveals um, Mink's commitment to research, <laughs> right? You know, she, everything that comes up in Congress, she has to take a vote. And so she's thoroughly going into these details and trying to think about what, what is the right thing to do? What is her position? And so I think the extensiveness of the paper reveals that. But the other thing I just wanna mention um, as we were talking is I remember her handwritten speeches and they're yeah. so eloquent and incomplete sentences. <laughs> I think about the way I draft and I have bullet points and I only use my computer, but she's writing things out longhand. And so I think it says something about the way that her mind works and the way that she communicates. And she's such a powerful writer as well. Yeah. So let's, let's um, focus uh, on some of those topics um, that we just mentioned. Um, to um, and and go back to um, the narrative of your book, um, Fierce and Fearless. Um, the book begins um, with a description of a family life um, for Asian immigrants and Americans of Japanese ancestry um, in Hawaii um, during the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, could you talk a little bit about how um, the racial and cultural hier hierarchies in Hawaii and in the United States more broadly um, during this time period affect, affected um, Patsy Mink's early years, um, especially in relation to her education. I just love this picture. They're so adorable, <laughs> Patsy and her brother Eugene. Um, so we begin by talking about the plantation society in Hawaii and how that was such a defining feature of both of the islands and of, of Mink's life and her political consciousness. Um, Hawaii was a native kingdom. Um, it was forcibly annexed to become part of the United States um, as a territory. Um, native Hawaiian um, communities, political leadership was displaced. Um, and what's put in place is a, a highly militarized and um, plantation economy that is hungry for labor. And so there's the importation of laborers from across the world, but especially in Asia, um, because of the location of, of the Hawaiian Islands. And so Mink's grandparents were all coming in the late 19th century as part of that wave of Japanese labor migration into Hawaii. And it's very clearly a hierarchical society. Um, it's the plantation owners who are Haole, who are at the top. Um, there's some people who are sort of in the middle who might be overseers, um, a large number of plantation workers they live in segregated housing areas and the educational structure in some ways replicates that as well. So there were these um, standard English schools. You had to be able to speak English like a Howley to be able to enter. And for a lot of the, the children of plantation workers, they spoke Creole, they spoke um, pidgin. So it was not even possible for them, right? They would have to test to go into those settings. Um, Mink herself was a third generation, which is a little bit unusual for someone who was born in the 1920s. I think a lot of people were second generation, but her parents were also born in Hawaii. And so she had more exposure to standard English, um, but she talks about how she felt really alienated and isolated when she was going to those schools. Um, and that experience of being a racial other was, was um, continued especially when she went to the mainland, um, to the, um, the States for her school. Um, she was always regarded as an international student, um, even though she was from a territory in the United States, and even though she was an American citizen. Um, and that experience of racialization was reinforced during World War II with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Japanese Americans in Hawaii were not en masse relocated and incarcerated like they were on the West Coast of the United States. 
but there was martial law that was instituted, instituted on the island. And um, Patsy's father himself was taken away and questioned. Um, and there was a lot of fear about whether he would be returned. Um, some of the family members tried to hide um, elements that would identify them as Japanese so that they might be marked as somehow traitors in the United States. Um, so I think that that racial awareness of being the other, that class awareness of distinct hierarchies was something that really profoundly shaped the way that Patsy Mink thought about equal rights, thought about justice, thought about having an equal place within the nation. Um, moving, moving, that's wonderful. Moving forward, um, Patsy Mink graduates from Chicago, University of Chicago Law School in 1951, and then moves back to Hawaii to establish her own law practice. You write in the book about the democratic revolution in Hawaii during the 1950s, which she and other young Democrats, including some returning veterans, helped to launch. And, and this, I have to tell you, this is one of my favorite parts of the, the collection or, or files from this period, because it must have been such a heady time. And I just want to give a shout out to my colleague. I hope she's on, on this call, um, Karen Femia. She was the one who organized um, this, this early material. Could you just you know, give us a little sense of why and how Patsy Mink became involved in politics? Um, well, you know, she had always um, had political uh, opinions and uh, was engaged by political issues. This is true when she was in college. Um, for example, she was part of a debate society debating heady issues like the role of government in providing health as a matter of right uh, to its citizens, questions like that. She was part of a University of Hawaii a student mock convention to explore and promote statehood as the next step for the development of the territory. So she was she was embroiled in thinking about politics quite a bit, even though she was a science major in college and, and on a path towards medical school. Um, when she came back from law school at the University of Chicago, she um, entered uh, a society much like the rest of US society that was uh, hostile to the entry of, of women into you know, sort of occupations of their choosing. And uh, she had door slam, she had all kinds of excuses uh, presented to her about why she couldn't be hired by law firms and things of that sort. Uh, she had to fight in order to even be allowed to take the bar exam in the territory of Hawaii. And I think all of those experiences also kind of um, intensified her concern for uh, political solutions to problems of inequality and stratification and, and all of that. So those things certainly pushed her in the direction of uh, political activism, uh, which meant uh, becoming part of the new sort of wellspring of popular politics through the vehicle of the Democratic Party in the post-war period. Um, she often joked later on that uh, if somebody had given her a job when she came back and wanted to practice law coming from the University of Chicago, she wouldn't have gone into politics because she'd be so busy in the courtroom, you know, litigating whatever the issues were. Um, I don't know whether that's the sort of the guts of the truth, but it certainly is a piece of uh, uh, the context in which she was living her life at the time. Well, you know, in the 1950s, um, she was the first in so many different categories. And one of the things we really enjoyed in the collection, we we're finding all these photographs where she was the only woman um, in whatever group, um, you know, the, the photographers was documenting. Um, she was really well positioned um, to run for and win the U.S. House seat following Hawaii's statehood in 1959. What happens in that, that 1959 race? And what impact did it have on her? I think that race is indicative of the ways in which race and gender really structure the political culture of um, Hawaii, but also more broadly the United States at the time. So 
Patsy was really welcome as a behind the scenes organizer initially as part of the democratic revolution. She was someone who was really desired because of her contributions, but when she herself wanted to become a political leader, it became more problematic. She was in the territorial um, house and Senate, but when she decided that she was gonna run for the house of representatives at the national level, the leadership in the democratic party you know, came down basically said, no, 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 we want other people to run. We want more senior members of the party, um, all the male <laughs> to run for the Senate position. We wanted Daniel Inoue, who was um, Inoue, <laughs> who at the time was was also an up and comer like, like um, Patsy Bean, but more, I think, aligned with the political leadership of the party. They wanted Daniel Inoue to run for the house and they did not want Patsy Bean to run at all. So she stuck to her, um, to her guns and said, I'm gonna run, this is my right to do so. But she didn't have the backing of the Democratic Party. She didn't have the backing of some of the labor unions that supported the party. She didn't have backing of the 442nd, right? This kind of veterans organization that was composed of Japanese American um, soldiers. And so she lost really badly. And um, there's, there's materials that talk about just what a big blow that was because she thought that people would you know, see her for who she was and what she wanted to represent. Um, and there were letters from constituents who would just say, you know, if I had to choose between you and a man, I would choose a man, right? He's going to be able to have access to these back, back room deals, bathroom deals, bathroom conversations. Um, so it was very explicitly a statement about um, gender representation. So um, what I admire about her though, is that she had these types of setbacks, multiple setbacks throughout her life, but she picked herself up and said, I'm gonna continue going. I'm gonna find a way to express my political beliefs. I'm gonna find a platform so I can create change. Um, and that's something that I found really powerful in a, a documentary about her life called Ahead of the Majority. She has this beautiful quote. I, well, I've run many times, I've lost many times but I've never given up this faith, this belief that I can make a difference. And, and she persisted and she ran again um, for Congress um, and she arrived, she, she won. Um, she arrived in Washington DC in 1965 as the first woman of color elected to Congress. Um, she was, as you note in the book, um, a double minority um, as both an Asian American and as a woman. Um, could you tell us a little bit about some of her early activism as a legislator in Congress? Um, some of her uh, early activism um, uh, developed in tandem with uh, Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty, uh, which proposed various policies that traveled through the committee that she sat on the House Education and Labor Committee. So she was, um, this, she was not the author of or the primary leader with respect to as a very junior member of Congress, but she was a hard worker for a lot of the Great Society programs, whether it was Job Corps or elementary secondary education expansion and uh, things of that sort. Um, for her own little sort of a uh, bailiwick of ideas that she wanted to bring to the table that nobody else was bringing to the table at that moment. She pursued issues like uh, childcare, developing early, child, early childhood education programs that would also serve as childcare vehicles to provide wage earning women with opportunities for their children to be uh, creatively and instructionally engaged while they were in the labor market or in the workplace. Um, she was very involved in legislative, uh, trying to figure out sort of legislative activities that could blunt the, uh, the evolution of Lyndon Johnson's war policy in Vietnam. Uh, she did a lot of that. She worked a lot on trying to um, bring visibility to uh, the cultural heritage of Hawaii, uh, to get uh, historical landmark designations for certain um, areas of the islands in order to protect them um, for native Hawaiian cultural purposes. Um, so, you know, she worked in all of these various venues in part um, 
in part with an emphasis of the committee she was serving on, Interior and Insular Affairs, as well as Education and Labor, and in part because some of those issues were so enormous that everyone in Congress had to take a hand in uh, figuring out how to, uh, how to proceed. And um, she was definitely, you know, a, a feminist. And one of your arguments in the book is that um, that Mink used diverse political tools and approaches and served as a bridge in various um, approaches to feminism, um, especially in her political activism. Um, could you tell us more about her particular kind of feminism? Thank you for that question. I love this image too, which is also in our book. So this is the protest by three members of Congress who are going to the house gym. Women had really restricted hours. They could only go like kind of very early in the morning for three days, whereas the male members of the house um, had full access. Um, and so they took the occasion um, when there was a, a flyer that was circulated to invite members of the house to uh, a class that they showed up and the staff there said, no, 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 this is only for members of the house. So they emphasize that they themselves are also members of the house. Um, so I, in the book, we talk about three different um, formulations of feminism that we can see um, through Patsy Mink's career. First of all, I think there's growing recognition of, of Mink, but there's still, I think is not enough recognition so for example, the most recent um, series, Mrs. America through Hulu, didn't even have Mink as a minor character, even though she was very much at the center of feminist political leadership during the 60s and 70s. Um, so I think to, in order to make her feminism more visible, uh, we talk about bridge feminism. So instead of thinking of her just as an exceptional person, an individual that's operating within the halls of Congress, to really think about her activism in conjunction with movement activists that she's partnering with people at the grassroots um, who are advocating and developing policies and she's helping to introduce these ideas into the political realm. And so I think that's one key idea. A second key idea that we talk about is intersectional legislative feminism. So instead of designing law for the universal citizen, which often defaults to a male subject and a white subject, that she's thinking about the plantation workers in Hawaii. She's thinking about impoverished women. Um, she's thinking about individuals who have, um, who experience intersectional forms of oppression and how might the law be used to address the concerns, the experiences that they have in their lives and how might the law offer more equity? How might the law um, redistribute resources so that those individuals who need it the most might be able to access those resources? And the third idea that we talk about is um, Pacific feminism, that Ming's location in Hawaii, which we began this conversation about, right? How does her experience of being in Hawaii, being the Pacific, how does that provide a certain set of um, uh, worldviews um, that translates into political values and how she brings those ideas with her to Washington, D.C.? And following up with that, um, she's Patsy Mink is probably perhaps best known um, by the general public um, for shepherding and defending Title IX, um, the legislation that prohibits sex discrimination in federally funded education programs. Um, and the 50th anniversary of Title IX is next month on June 23rd. Um, could you tell us a bit um, about Patsy's role in Title IX and the importance also of the Women's Educational Equity Act. Um, did you discover anything surprising as you explored this part of, of her history in more detail? Well, I'll leave it to Judy to answer the surprising part. Um, the the uh, Title IX occupies sort of a, a central role in my family's history in a way. So, I can't say that there was um, much that was surprising about that story that uh, you know sort of appeared to me in the in the papers. Although certainly there was a lot of rich stuff uh, in the in the collection that uh, we both made use of. Um, I would have to, the, in the interest of time, I would have to say 
that the first thing to know about Title IX is that it emerges in a foment of gender equality uh, mobilization in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Um, so Title IX is not, was not freestanding legislation. Title IX wasn't, wasn't even called Title IX until the final passage of the final legislative vehicle that it um, was a part of. Um, what becomes Title IX uh, effectively emerges from movement pressures in the late 60s, but also from conversations that my mother had with Congresswoman Edith Green of Oregon, who was considerably senior to her and chair of the subcommittee uh, on the Education and Labor Committee that would be able to um, manage the, the legislative uh, process for such a measure when it eventually came to pass. The conversations they had emerged out of hearings related to great society programs actually, and to the reauthorization of the Vocational Education Act in the late 1960s, where both of them confronted the incredible sort of masculinism of uh, funding that was going towards the education of low-income people, like uh, skills training for boys and men, for example, but not the equivalent kind of training for girls and women that would lead them to equivalently remunerative uh, jobs and so forth. And so they began to sort of develop an itch to figure out a way to prohibit the kinds of discriminatory uh, educational practices that reinforce the gender tracking and gender socializing of young people and people who were exploring uh, vocational opportunities. Um, they sort of discussed with each other and, and separately, uh, my, in my mother's case, with um, movement activists, policy activists, different ways of proceeding. Um, the Civil Rights Act, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act prohibited uh, race-based discrimination in programs that received federal assistance. And so that was sort of a model for what might be done uh, with respect to sex and gender. Some, at, for some short period of time, they thought about uh, trying to amend the Civil Rights Act, but that seemed like playing with fire um, because there were a lot of uh, haters of the Civil Rights Act. So to open it up for amendment seemed like, um, uh, seemed undesirable. Uh, my mother introduced a bill in 1970 that would have uh, accomplished what Title VI of the Civil Rights Act did with respect to race, um, but would do it with respect to gender, called the Women's Equality Act. And then ultimately in 1971, uh, Edith Green, um, who was managing the Omnibus Education Act amendments of, of that year, um, figured out a way to make that omnibus bill the vehicle for including a prohibition on sex and gender discrimination in ed education at all levels. And so uh, they went with that. Um, Beyond, beyond that, though, I would have to say that the enactment of Title IX in 1972, while uh, a fantastic moment, uh, which came sort of in the aftermath of, of the Congress passing the Equal Rights Amendment. So the, not only did Title IX emerge in a, in a, in a ferment of, of uh, equality activity, it was also um, you know, sort of part of the crest of that equality activity in the mid 19th in mid-1972, um, but that was not the end of the story. Uh, the story really proceeded into the middle of the 1970s um, because Title IX simply prohibited discrimination without defining all, all aspects of that discrimination. And so the struggle uh, ensued over the federal implementation guidelines that uh, had to be developed before Title IX could be enforced. And in that fight, my mother was the legislative leader uh, to make sure that Title IX had the most comprehensive application possible. Uh, she fought against various carve outs, particularly with respect to athletics and uh, phys ed um, in order to make sure that all program activities involved in educational institutions would be subject to the same um, guarantee of gender equity in, in education. I'll just add a, a couple things. Um, 
One is that I was surprised to see that the legislative battle was not so much about the passage, right? But it's about the implementation and the defense of it and the ongoing defense of it because there were various efforts to dilute Title IX. And then many of us associate with sports, um, which has had a transformative impact, but it's really all aspects of educational experience. So admissions, scholarship, housing, employment, right? Um, educational climate. So it really was comprehensive. Um, so I, I think that period between passing Title IX 72 and then the issuing of the, the guidelines of how it actually is implemented, you see the intensity of resistance. And there's a really um, important vote that takes place um, in which Wendy was sadly in a car accident and her mother was pulled away. And unfortunately the opposition passed by one vote that day. Um, but because of um, various ways in which the legislation has to be approved or changes have to be approved, there was a revote. And that's when you see the partnership between Patsy and movement activists because they basically invaded uh, the Congress halls and they pursued legislators and talked to them about why it was so important to take that revote. Um, I just love that, that setting, right, of these movement activists taking control and saying, you have to vote, you have to give the women this opportunity. Um, the other thing I just wanted to mention, because I think that was part of the question a little bit, is that in addition to Title IX, which in some ways is a, a, a negative act, it's about banning discrimination. Um, there's also the Women's Educational Equity Act. And that was a piece of legislation that provided resources to change curriculum, to support women's studies, to support women's centers. Because you can't just say, okay, you can't discriminate, but, but how do you actually fundamentally transform educational culture so that girls and boys have the ability to imagine their lives differently, right? Not just in the stereotypical roles that have been assigned to them, but how do you change the way in which textbooks are written? How do you change curriculum? How do you change a campus culture? And so I think having both those pieces of legislation in conversation with each other is really important. Oh, I just want to second that. Um, the, the papers absolutely bear this out. So the, the files on um, you know, the regulations and then defending Title IX against amendments, and then the files on the Women's Educational Equity Act are incredibly rich. Um, so yeah, it's, um, they're, they're excellent. Um, it's an excellent documentation on that. You know, yeah, as much, I mean, and rightly so, you know, we think about Patsy Mink in terms of Title IX. I love the fact that for part two, I think it is, of the book um, on, on the Great Society, um, you actually open that part with her position on the Vietnam War and not on Title IX, um, which, which I, I would love to hear the reason why. Um, I think I know the reason why, uh, but I, I, would love to, I would love to hear you explain that. I'm actually interested in your, your thoughts, May. <laughs> but I can start first and then I'd love to hear your, your reflections. Um, this picture actually was in my previous book, which was about the anti-war movement um, and the ways in which international travel sh shape American political imaginaries. And so in some ways it was a carryover from my previous project. But I think for Patsy Mink, it was even more important because I think this is one of the earliest votes that she took in Congress. And it reflected her commitment to democratic processes, to peace, um, at the expense even of her own position within the Democratic Party. I was mentioning earlier that she had this uncomfortable relationship with the party at the local level. When she enters Congress, it's Lyndon Johnson, it's her party's um, president. <laughs> and you see her trying to um, articulate a commitment towards a peaceful process of conflict resolution that will put her in opposition to the main leader of a party. And I think it's so important to showcase that courage that she has because other members of Congress who were Democrats who might have had questions were not as bold as she was in making this argument. I think the other aspects about her anti-war stance um, was about her racial understanding of the war, that it was a racialized war. Um, and you can definitely see that in terms of who's being sent to fight right from the US side, but also whose lives are being um, destroyed in, in Southeast Asia. 
um, and whose lives are seen as sort of lesser than and more expendable in the American imagination. So I think that racial analysis is very important. And then um, there's also the feminist diplomacy. So that image is of Bella Abzug, uh, who becomes her best friend in Congress. Um, I love the stories about them sitting next to each other and even wearing some of the same clothing. Um, but they travel to Paris because um, Bella Opsu comes from an organization of Women's Start for Peace, and they really argue that, you know, are there ways in which women can have an intervention in international politics? Um, given their assigned roles as, as um, caretakers, and then also for this organization, they take on that role of, of being housewives and mothers. Um, can we stop nuclear war? Can we stop um, right, conflicts that are, that are going to kill so many family members? And they're seen here with Manon Winti Bin, who arguably is the most recognizable Vietnamese women in international peace circles at that time. She was in Paris as part of the negotiations of the Paris Peace Accord, and she also frequently met with anti-war activists. Um, so those are some of the reasons why I became, I'm so committed to thinking about this set of issues, but Meg, what, what are your thoughts? Well, I actually, yeah, I think I was right um, in terms of, of why you might have done it. I, I think her opposition to the war um, and her willingness to challenge the president on this ended up shaping her relationship to an extent within the National Democratic Party and certainly with the Johnson administration. I remember there was a um, note, and I wish I had called up this box from offsite storage before today. Um, one of her first meetings, if not the first meeting with Johnson, you, know, you, you, you get your whatever five minutes, you know, with the king and, and you have to kind of decide what to talk about. And, and she chooses to talk about the war in Vietnam. Um, so you now she's got her like, well, however many seconds or minutes, um, and she chooses to, to focus on that. Um, there's this wonderful photograph that I forget whether it's in your book or not of it's a trip that Johnson makes to Hawaii. And um, and Patsy Mink, um, I think, is already in Hawaii, or does she travel with him? Um, He's already, but, but yeah. But he kind of, yeah, he grabs her arm, you know, and, and like, you know, typical Johnson kind of manhandling, um, grabs her arm, you know, into a forced wave. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, her activism during the Great Society, during her first tenure in Congress, to an extent, um, is against the backdrop of her opposition to the war. And, um, and then again, you know, the impact that has on her relationship with the Johnson administration. Um, and as we keep talking about, she perseveres. Um, and her work also with um, orphans in Vietnam, um, and then later on with refugees. Um, those, those files are just absolutely incredible. Thanks, Meg. I'm also just reminded that she ran for the U.S. presidency because of the war in Vietnam. <laughs> so right, it was, exactly. It was anti-war yeah, activists in Oregon who drafted her to run for the presidency. Wendy, do you want to say more? Because I think this episode is really fascinating that you're coming of age and you're um, getting involved in anti-war protests along with your dad and um, do you want to share anything about this particular time period in your lives? Can I can I just ask uh, also, Wendy, did, didn't you skip school to attend an anti-war rally? Do I remember that yeah. correctly? Yeah, I did. I did. I did many of, of those sorts of things. Um, I think people will just have to read our book to, to get the vignette that tells the full story of being a teenager who was against the war with a parent who was against the war that was uh, more challenging than it sounds. Um. So I, I think I'm gonna have to interrupt, even though this is a wonderful conversation, um, we only have about 10 minutes left and uh, we do have some questions um, in the audience Q&A. Um, so I'm gonna switch um, to um, asking some of those questions. Um, let's see. So, uh, in researching my book, Conquering Heroines, about the 1970 sex discrimination complaints that were filed against colleges, I discovered that the nomination of G. Harold Carswell to the U.S. Supreme Court in 1970 was the first time a Supreme Court nominee was challenged on the basis of positions he had taken in a sex discrimination case. Representative Mink and Betty Friedan were those uh, who first testified against him, and it helped galvanize and organize women 
at the grassroots level. Can you share anything more about that episode? And P.S., I also wrote a biography of Ellie Peterson, a key Republican leader who was also left out of the Miss America miniseries. Your work sounds fascinating. Do you want me to begin, Wendy, or do you want to begin? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we do talk about story. Yeah, we do talk about the opposition to Carswell. And I love this quote when she's, she testifies and says that he is an affront to women of America. <laughs> like that is the basis for why um, he should not be um, supported as a Supreme Court nominee. Um, so I won't go into great detail, but it is something that's part of the book. And then also we talk again about her opposition to Clarence Thomas. Um, so it's a, a theme <laughs> that runs through the book um, and the ways in which intersectional understandings of feminist oppression or female oppression underlies her opposition to both candidates. Okay, thanks, Judy. Um, uh, here's another question. Can you share more about uh, your experiences working together? How did you navigate disagreements um, when it came to your understanding of history? You're gonna have to take this one first, Wendy. Yeah, I don't know that we had much in the way of disagreements about understandings of history. I don't know, what, what's your impression, Judy? Um, no. in, in, some, in some ways we were, working separately and that I was conceiving and writing the vignettes and she was conceiving and writing the narrative chapters and then we would bring things together and look at the whole uh, sort of arc that was developing in, in, in the story. And of course we conferred over what the chapters would emphasize, which determined what the vignettes would em you know, emphasize and so forth. But I don't think that we had any fundamental intellectual disagreements that we needed to navigate or uh, work through. Yeah, I think um, early on, we talked about having the vignettes at the end of each chapter, and then we decided it would be, work better at the beginning. And I think that affected our writing process because earlier on, you would wait for me to write the chapter and then you would write the vignette. Right. Um, and then towards the end, as it became involved with moving to UC Irvine, involved in other things, you would write the vignettes and then I would write the chapters. But I didn't actually look at your writings before I wrote mine. So I was trying to have more my kind of my mindset and analysis um, before I think we then engage with each other. Right, um, same here. I didn't read your chapters on the subject area that my vignettes touched until after I wrote the vignette because I didn't want to be either, yeah, I didn't want to sort of constrain myself by what I knew you were already saying, or, you know, somehow guide myself in order to fit what you were saying, if you can follow me. So it yeah. really was sort of, you know, path A, path B, and then we brought things together and re-evaluated and made changes on, in both tracks um, moving forward. I was very reluctant to edit Wendy. <laughs> I think as the daughter, <laughs> she should have full say. Um, I think we might have had differences about which portions of her life to emphasize, because even having written, you know, I don't know how many long or how long her books, right, that we can't cover everything. Um, and I was really fascinated by the period when she was away from the House of Congress, uh, House of Representatives. So she was in Congress from 65 to 77, and again from 1990 to 2002. And I really wanted to explore that time period. And so I think we talked about like how much emphasis to place on, on different um, episodes of her life. And I remember the last chapter being particularly challenging because we were trying to make sense of, of immigration politics in the 1990s and how to frame what was possible, what was being articulated. Um, so I thought those conversations were really, I mean, at the time it was, we were trying to finish the book. So I was like, oh, what are we doing? But I think it was really helpful for us to engage with each other in these conversations. I just, I just want to jump in. I, I think that the way you wrote the book with vignettes and then the analysis of the period just makes the book such a good read. It's, um, it is absolutely terrific. 
And I would have to agree with that. That was that was I think one of my favorite parts of the book, like how the two um how your sections, you know, were kind of talking to each other. Um and I really another question. You. I'm glad it worked. <laughs> um <laughs> I was also going to say, I, it's so gratifying to receive this feedback um, because Meg was in some ways my entry point <laughs> into um, Patsy Mink, and then you really know the papers. Um, and Liz, I'm so appreciative of you organizing this event. You know, I feel like I, I didn't spend 10 years completely at the Library of Congress, <laughs> but I did begin the process in 2012. So I, over the 10 years, I've visited multiple times. And so it feels like that's one of the academic homes of the project. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm gonna ask uh, another question here um, in, in the Q&A. Um, let's see, uh, Mahalo Nui Loa, I, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, for sharing about your book. As AAPI women in academia and in the spirit of Congresswoman Mink, what advice do you have for AAPI women like myself who are considering entering this field? Over to Judy, the professor. I once asked Wendy if she thought about running for office and she kind of gave me this um, indication that she's allergic to it. <laughs> Having grown up as a child as someone who had to engage in campaigns and to get, engage in campaigns um, often, right? There's a two year term. And so you're constantly campaigning. Um, and then I was surprised to find this out, but everybody in Congress has the same budget. So no matter where you're located physically, you have the same budget for traveling. <laughs> so just think about the geographical distance and the time dis difference between um, right, going from DC to Hawaii. Um, and she would do this frequently because she would want to be in, um, in consultation with her constituents. Um, well, I mentioned this film by Kimberly Basford, who I, which I really love, and she chose the, the title Ahead of the Majority. And it's from a quote that Patsy Mink, um, a speech that Patsy Mink gave in 1975 when she was running for the Senate and she did not win. But she talks about how you need to be ahead of the majority. You can't, be, you can't wait for something to be popular or safe to stand up for an issue that you have to take that stand. You have to be bold and you persuade other people that that's the right path. And so I just love that local vision. I mean, you know, be bold, be ahead of the majority, like take risks. Um, and then the other thing I just wanna share is that she, Patsy Mink was from the margins of the margins, right? So her district was not Honolulu. It was not the financial and political capital of Hawaii. It was the plantation towns, it was agricultural areas, it was the neighboring islands, right? These are the people who sent Mink to Congress so that she could have a voice and have this incredible impactful political career. Um, and so I think it's it's a lesson for us, right? It's the, 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 the small, the little people, right? The people who um, you might not necessarily think of who can make a difference. Um, so those are my two, my two lessons. Wendy, did you want to add anything? No, I, I think Judy covered both of okay. them. Great. Well, we're just about out of time. I know we have more questions in the chat, um, and I'm sorry um, we can't get to everyone's question, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap things up by thanking you so much, um, Wendy and Judy, um, for joining uh, Meg and me um, today to discuss your research and, um, and your new book, um, Fierce and Fearless. Um, Patsy Mink's life is um, its such an, a compelling and inspiring history um, and your biography um, provides us, I think, with a much richer understanding um, of her politics, feminism, her achievements. Um, as I said, it's, it's very inspiring. Um, and thank you everyone um, um, who attended uh, today's Made at the Library event. Um, if you're interested in learning more about research in the manuscript division, Please check out our webpage um, for more information or submit your questions. If we didn't get to answer your questions today, you can submit um, those questions to ask.loc.gov forward slash manuscripts. Um, again, thank you for attending and have a great rest of your day.